For a very long time, Ishant Sharma was one of the worst bowlers to regularly play test cricket. I mean, if you can be bad while taking 200 wickets, then he did that. And no one else really ever had. Ishant was completely one of a kind. He was one of a kind as an Indian pacer. He was one of a kind as a high average wicket taker. And he was one of a kind as perhaps the greatest comeback story in test cricket. Bangalore, 2007. India have made 626. Pakistan are 96 overs into their innings and every batsman has made a double figure score so far. There have already been 300s and a double. A team who looks pretty much more like a young boy with more hair than any human needs, perhaps braces on his teeth and an extremely prominent Adam's apple is bowling. A ball from a good length jumps up and it makes Fuzzle Iqbal's forward defense look idiotic. It flies off the gloves to a deepish short leg Extra bounce on a flat one in Bangalore with a wicket caught at short leg for an Indian seam bowler. This may not seem like a big deal to you hearing it now, but you live in a world where India has fast bowlers. A boy who was more Adam's apple than man took five wickets in that innings. Where you enter the timeline changes your perspective of everything, especially Indian fast bowlers. Some people lived through the era where Indian seamers seemed to run in quicker than they bowled the ball. Indian seamers were skillful and slow. There were a few flare-ups. Mohammad Nisar bowled India's first ball in tests and perhaps their quickest ball for about 40 years. Kapil Dev and Javagal Srinath were probably not fast fast, but they both were quick at one stage and Zahir Khan and Ashish Nira certainly had some pace. But it's not just about pace, it's about seam up at all. This is a list of every Indian seamer who has over five wickets. It is not a very big list. It's actually incredible that India have managed to get someone over 400 wickets with a ball, although they could bat a bit as well. Zahir Khan and Ishant Sharma are over 300, and then Javagal Srinath is over 200. And that's it for the entire 200 club. There's only four more in the 100 club. It doesn't quite make Ishant one of a kind, but it's pretty close. But I think I can illustrate this better. Surab Ganguly has taken the 27th most seen wickets for India of all time. Now his bowling was absolutely the greatest thing about him, but he averaged 52 with the ball, and he should not be your 27th best anything with his bowling. And you can see it another way via the opposition teams. South Africa has the highest percentage of wickets taken from pace in tests. India is nearly half of that. Only Bangladesh has fewer per test. And when you're talking less wickets with pace than Sri Lanka, something has gone very wrong. So think again, back to that wicket. Ishan Sharma has lifted the ball off a flat pitch when he is so young. He's tall, he's fast. At that stage for India, he really was one of a kind. But it wasn't just that one ball. To really understand the hype around early Ishan, you need to hear about the Ricky Ponting story. For the kid he's stumbling here without heading over to Ru Belinda's channel first, Ricky Ponting was probably the best batsman for a time. Sachin was better for longer. Lara had higher heights, but there was a period where Ponting was an absolute brutal force. He dominated the early aughts. And if he had a weakness, it was against spin. Against the quicks, he was basically peerless. In the first eight tests he went up against Ishant Sharma, the skinny tall bloke from India tortured the world's best player of quick bowling for taking him six times. In their direct matchup, Ponting just could not get him away. This isn't what you expect from the man who had been hitting the best quicks for six against an Indian teenager. And just look at the trajectory of this ball. It's obscene. It should be a tattoo on the small of someone's back. Ponting was jumping because he was beaten by a mile and this happened again and again in this spell. There were leaves he shouldn't have made, he almost hit one to short leg and a lot of just Ponting trying to stay alive. It was an Indian seamer tormenting an Australian great against quicks at the Wacker. It was incredible and you couldn't help but fall for Isha. And I did. In fact, my friend Graham tweeted this to me recently. At the time I did think he'd be very good but I also thought he'd need a lot of patience. But no one thought he'd be this good. And who on earth would believe that a player would get 70 tests of patience? I have never seen it before. Even all-rounders don't get that kind of treatment. And his story is so similar to the history of Indian seam. It took a long time, but gee, when it came good, it came real good. But let's look at his overall record for a second. These are all the bowlers who have bowled in his era and taken 100 wickets. They're sorted by their average and their number of wickets. They all fit into a bit of a pattern, except Ishan. 
who is really one of three bowlers on his own. The first is Ryan Harris, who if he arrived in cricket with cartilage in his knees would have been over here. And then there is Nathan Lyon, a finger spinner in Australia, and we'll have more on that in a moment. But it's almost impossible to tell the story of Ishan's career by looking at the entire thing. It's a mess. During his era, there have been three other bowlers who have taken roughly 300 wickets. This is all of their cumulative averages per test. And none of these guys had straightforward careers. Southie was another teen prodigy who played far too early because of a thirsty cricket culture. Mornay Morkel was perhaps one of the greatest first change bowlers who ever seemed to take four for 80 no matter what went on in the game. And Mitchell Johnson was up and down for much of his career before it all came right. And these guys all got to 300 wickets way quicker than Ishant did. And their career numbers follow fairly normal patterns. Ishant does something completely extraordinary. I figured James and Anderson would be similar, as both started slow and then got good. But even then you see that Ishan actually started really well and then got terrible. And Anderson's numbers were coming down with some bumps from around the 20 test mark. Ishan didn't get that until the 50th test. When Crick Info looked for someone similar to him, they couldn't find anyone either. The only 300 wicket taker Ishan's career looks like is Ian Botham's, but the inverse. And it's worth noting something else in that same article. They show that Ishan is the most improved bowler over a long career ever. And if you're a long time viewer over here, you know I've already given him my Lifetime Achievement Award for improvement on another video. And as you can see here, it's worth noting that seamers usually decay a lot. They don't really generally improve that much. But let me try and explain his career a little better here. This is where struggling Asian seamers end up. And this is where gun Asian seamers are. Ishan is neither. But I just want to discuss his Asian seamerness a little bit more. I have this half-formed thought in my head that Asian seamers are like non-Asian spinners. They make little sense at home, except in rare circumstances, but you don't want to be without them. And then when they travel, they suddenly have to do things they've never quite done before, and you expect them to dominate. It's not always true. There are obviously greats like Wazim and Wacker and Warn. But when you look at Ishant from the first 70 tests of his career and compare him with other bowlers of that time, he is smack bang in the middle of a bunch of non-Asian spinners. This is Monty Panasar and Dan Vittori. Over here is Ashley Giles and Nikki Boye. And right next to Ishant is Paul Harris. And just to go a bit further, this is Delhara Fernando. This area over here has even more Asian seamers. If you're looking for a nearest neighbor to Ishant's early career, I'd say Fidel Edwards, Delhara Fernando and Paul Harris are the three. None of them went on to have long careers. It's also worth mentioning the weird psychological thing about all of it. For some of these players, they were carried at home and then expected to be world beaters away. But in truth, they got into the side by being good at home. They're accessories for their team right up into the moment they're supposed to be Avengers. And from everything I've said so far, you would expect that Ishant would have done very well at home or very poorly at home and very well away or very poorly away. But actually, he's kind of split the difference and been almost the same in both. That despite tests where he's been the token seamer in places like Nagpur, when he's been thrown the ball because it should reverse and it doesn't, when the other team is already 600 on a pancake and he's supposed to make something happen, or when he loses the new ball because even though he might take a wicket, the spinner probably will. There should be some kind of counselling service that only works with non-Asian spinners and Asian seamers. But during his career, he's been far better than other seamers in Asia. There's no real argument in that, but he is defined by being an Asian seamer. If you averaged five runs better than standard anywhere else in the world, we'd be covering figurines in your honour. Ishan is 13% better than standard, but because the average is so high, no one cares. This is all the seamers with minimum 300 wickets from 100 turf and how many wickets they take per game. Other than Callis, who didn't bowl that often because, you know, he didn't have to, Ishant has the least amount of wickets per test. And the second least is Jamin Devas. And just above him is Kapil Dev. Those two at least had the added skill of some batting. Ishant is just a bowler. He is at best not a terrible night watchman. And so Ishant is here on his own as a long-term specialist seam bowler who never actually bowled that much. And his Asian seamerness is a big deal. Non-Asian seamers don't have records like this. It is simply not a thing. And so for him to even be an outlier among them tells you something about him. If you cast your mind back to around the same time that Ishant's career started, Stephen Finn's bowling average is still lower than Ishant Sharma's and he hasn't played a test in five years. And he won't play another one unless the world starts spinning in a different direction. 
Finn and Ishan went through rough patches at around the same time. They both have skills that don't combine very often, and they're both incredibly talented and flawed players, but Finn just disappeared, and Ishan was persevered with. And it's not just England, look at Pakistan. Other teams haven't had to stick with their players as they have had a mill producing them. India stuck with Ishan because he remained tall and fast and swingy, even if it wasn't always pretty because they couldn't find anyone else tall and fast and swingy. But we need to focus on the first 70 tests of his career, the horror stretch, because they were extraordinary and obviously not so much in a good way. So here are all the seamers with over 75 wickets during the first 70 tests of Ishan's career. These are the guys that dominated this era. These are the guys who didn't play much because they had poor records. And these are the guys beginning or ending strong careers. Now look at Ishan. He is a man alone. It's like he's a mistake here and shouldn't have even happened. He has the wickets of a star, but the average of someone who got dropped. India just persisted over and over again through a lack of options and his unique skill set. This sort of long early career struggling isn't that rare for batsmen. Plenty of players have been given huge ropes in cricket without ever making that back. There are bowlers too, especially non-Asian spinners, but a few seamers as well. But they are usually in poor teams or they're all-rounders. India's record is 71-38-31 in the years they've had Ishan. They became the number one test team for the first time, did it again after, won a World Cup, a World T20, and even a Champions Trophy. We will get to that. This is like a batsman playing a lot of tests with an average of under 35, except that happens a little bit. As do spinners with a plus 35 average. Seamers are usually discarded with these numbers, and most of the players kept are in struggling sides, not in incredibly successful ones. And perhaps Ishant would have been dropped, but injuries in his own freak skill set meant that he stuck around. And the thing is, occasionally his skills paid off massively for India. In the 2013 final of the Champions Trophy, England needed 20 runs in 26 balls with six wickets in hand and two set batsmen at the crease. They should have won easy. But Ishan bowled two short balls, and neither were great. One was wide and the other one was middled, but he dismissed Owen Morgan and Ravi Bopara, and England lost. The height was always handy. And then there was Lords in 2014, when India set England 319, and Ishan took wickets of Root, Cook, Pryor, and Stokes in his 7 for 74. Again, lots of short balls. But for every game like this, there seemed to be a heap of other moments, like the time he briefly made James Faulkner into one of the most feared cricketers in the world. Sharma put up one of the most incredible overs in cricket history to turn a near certain whim into a huge loss. And these three games are all like in the same era, the 2013-2014 moment. Even when he was a king, he found a way to set fire to his own castle. Through much of his struggling early period, his defenders would suggest that Ishant was just unlucky. And part of this passes the eye test. How often in the middle of his career, he would bowl a series of unplayable in-swingers that would bounce over the top of the stumps, but still end up with a non in the innings. But a lot of things have changed since then. He doesn't bowl the bad balls he was known for when he was younger. He now keeps the pressure on. He's gone a little bit wider on the crease, but he's also bowling at the stumps a little bit more. Around him, he has fit and firing bowlers. Zahi Khan was often injured, Mohamed Shami too. But Ishant now has um, Umesh Yadav, another player who's developed like he has. But there's also Shami and Bumrah, and there's a whole flock of younger bowlers coming through. There's always someone for him to bowl with. India now has one of the best fast bowling platoons in cricket. In that sense, Ishant is no longer always alone. And he uses that angle he has, coming wide of the wickets now to right-handers as a tactic rather than a flaw. And against left-handers, everything has changed. He was poor against right-handers before, but even worse against lefties. And he's actually improved more against right-handers. But what he's done against left-handers is really interesting. He was a bit slow to realize, like pretty much all right-arm seamers, that he should be bowling around the wicket to him. And now that he's worked that out, this is his record when bowling over the wicket and around the wicket to left-handers in the last four years. He's also been working with people like Bharat Aran, Jason Gillespie, and Stefan Jones on his bowling. And Gillespie is the player that Ishant is most often compared to as a bowler, probably because he's tall, is quick, and had long hair. But Gillespie bowled very full, and my thought was always that Ishant just bowled a bit too short. And it's a terrible thing to say, because it's what your uncle says about pretty much every seam bowler in the world. 
but Ishan's lengths have changed. Before 2017, he didn't bowl what we classify as a good length for seamers that often, and now he does. He was a bouncer and back of a length and Yorker bowler, and now he's a length bowler. And certainly, I would never tell your uncle, but the fuller Ishan has bowled, the better he has become. I mean, the truth is right here. All those other things have played a part, but Ishan is a better bowler now, and he's a fuller bowler now. This is him in his first 70 tests, and this is him since. If Richie Benno was here, he'd just be silent. He'd let you drink this in. But I'm not Richie Benno. In the before time, he was averaging the same as Saranga Lakma. For the end, it's been better than Dale Steyn. Since the start of 2018, he's been averaging under 20. And if you're thinking, well, the last few years have been great for bowlers, you're right. But that doesn't explain at all what he has done here, because he has gone from being worse than average to being way better than average. And I don't know, maybe this is what other bowlers would have done if they'd had 70 matches to warm up, but no one has ever done this before. Not even the other Asian seamers have done anything like this. I thought Zahir Khan might be the only one who had actually played long enough, but his average was under 35 by his 47th test. And he started slower as well but he was in, well in control of his average from around the 20 test mark. But after 53 tests, Ishan was averaging a shocking 38.81. And perhaps it was his good beginning that gave them so much hope. Because as you can see, Zahir struggled early on and then worked it out. But the other thing that is very interesting about both of these bowlers is that India did not produce bowlers like them before. So they were harder to discard. I think if you live through both these bowlers, chances are you still think that Zahir was a better bowler. Despite the fact that Ishan now has a slightly better average overall. But it's impossible not to be amazed at Ishan. It was easy to keep Zahir as he was left arm and fast. Even his foot marks helped their off spinners. And he was more or less in control of his career from his 25th test. But Dhoni in India also saw something in Ishan that they couldn't find anywhere else. He was tall, fast and could bowl reverse. So they kept him around, even though the numbers and the general eye test suggested they should not have kept him. Sure, in some games he wouldn't need to bowl. In 14 matches in his career, he's barely bowled. India often used him just as an insurance case if everything else has gone wrong. But when he did bowl, you could bowl him into the ground because he had incredible endurance. Anything you want to say about Ishant, you can't say he didn't earn this good fortune because he waited and he worked. And then finally, things and then finally, things did turn. These are the golden years. And he is now unquestionably one of the best bowlers in the world. Even for someone who thought he would have a great career when he was young, this seems bizarre having lived through it all. And I feel attached to Ishan because I started writing about cricket right at the time he made his debut. And I feel like we've been on this journey together. I once did a podcast with my father in about 2010 and even my father thought Ishan was going to be a gun. It's just that no one knew we'd have to wait this long. And yeah, it came good, but geez, it got dark. In 2014, I put Ishant Sharma's name into Google one day, and the third autofill result was jokes. Usually players like him get a break, they get dropped, but Ishant had to play through all the mocking. For almost a decade, he was one of the biggest punchlines in Indian society. A country so large and diverse that it struggles to come together on anything, all decided that Ishant was funny. And let's step back from the jokes just to factor in the Indian part here. We often talk about how hard it must have been for Sachin Tendulkar to carry the hopes and expectations of a billion people. It's okay to handle pressure if you're one of the greatest batsmen who have ever lived. How hard is it to handle the jeers and jokes if you're a below average bowler for a decade? And Agarka did this in the 90s, which was just a kinder and gentler time. Ishant did this while India's 24-hour news channels were born, as social media took over, and while the WhatsApp revolution happened. It was like every micro-generation found him anew to laugh at him. And it's not like players don't become unfair punchlines in other countries. It happened to Shane Watson in Australia and Ms. al Haq in Pakistan. But India is just bigger. The jokes are louder. There are less places to hide. Ishant had to learn bowling while he was at test level, while he was being mocked by a billion people. I'm trying to think of any athlete who's ever had to go through this for so long. I mean, maybe I'm forgetting about some Brazilian centre back who played for a whole generation because Brazil couldn't find someone else. But there are more people in India and the amount of mobile devices and social media now is just so different. You could make a solid argument for Ishan Sharma being the most consistently mocked athlete in history. The only athletes who've probably been mocked more have been, I don't know, alleged murderers or cheats. And there are individual moments like J.R. Smith. But Ishan was a punchline for almost a decade to a billion people. If there is any other athlete who has remained at the top of their sport while struggling to perform, known by that many people, while being mocked and abused as often, 
I just can't think of them. And to live through that would be tough on anyone. To live through it and then dominate at the back end of your career when most seam bowlers are on the wane. I mean, I don't know. It's just one of the greatest comeback stories ever. Except he never went away. His every long hop, no ball and loose one was right there in front of us until he stopped bowling them, pitched it up a bit, came around the wicket and became a better bowler than the Bangalore match ever showed us. Almost everyone gave up on him. But Ishant kept running in. It didn't matter if they gave him five overs or 50. A newer old ball. He just went for it. And let us compare him to perhaps the best bowler in the world at the moment, Pat Cummins. The early Pat Cummins years are a mystery. We have a one test a bit like the Bangalore or Ricky Ponting spell, and then years where we didn't have to watch him. The early Ishant years were hashtag daily. We saw every pimple and laughed along in shared cruelness. And look what happens when you compare the two of them now. That is incredible. For a very long time, Ishan Sharma was one of the worst bowlers to regularly play test cricket. Now, for quite a few years, he's one of the best. And he sits alone as perhaps the greatest comeback story in test cricket. I mean, don't call it a comeback. He's been here for years. He is the one and only Ishan Sharma.